Welcome to Programming with Professor Califf. Today I'd like to talk about making decisions in our Java programs. Unless we do something to change it, our programs use what we call sequential processing. That means that the Java statements that we write in our programs are executed in a sequence, each one following the next. As long as that's all we use, our programs can do complex things, but they always do the same complex thing. Since we have variables and can get data from the user, the data can be different, but our program treats all of the data in the same way. We want to be able to have the program react differently to different inputs to make decisions based on the data it has. So let's think a little bit about decisions in the real world, because people make decisions all the time. Things like, do I stop the car? Where will I exercise? Will I take my warrior or my priest to the raid? What will I do tonight? So let's think about what those kinds of decisions might look like in pseudocode algorithms. So for the car, we might have, if the light is green, then keep going, else stop the car. Or if it's raining or too cold, then use the treadmill inside, else walk outside. If we have enough tanks, then I'll bring my priest, else I'll bring my warrior. If my homework is due tomorrow, then I'll do my homework, else I'll play Overwatch. In programming, we often refer to this as selection. We're selecting which actions to take based on the information that we have. One of the ways we demonstrate the concept is with something called a flowchart. So I've given you an example of what a flowchart might look like. So here we're going to start at the left hand side and we're doing statements that are just following along with our sequential processing. And then we come to this decision. We represent decisions with diamonds in flowcharts. And so suppose that the decision we need to make is true. Then we're going to take this true branch and do the two statements there before we come back together to follow along with more sequential processing. Now it could be that instead of the true branch, when we get to that decision point, we're going to find that things are false. In that case, we'll go down and do the statement on that branch. There could be any number of statements on either branch. And then we'll join up and continue with our sequential processing. So what does all of this look like in Java? We'll have a keyword if in lowercase letters. All of our keywords in Java are generally going to be in lowercase letters. Followed by a condition in parentheses. The parentheses are required. That has to evaluate to either true or false. Then we have a pair of curly braces between which we can put whatever statements we want to do when the condition is true. Then we have the keyword else followed by more curly braces with the statements that should be executed when the condition is false. Note that the curly braces are actually not required if we want to have just one statement in that branch, but it's usually considered good practice to include them. The statements are any Java statements, just like the ones we write when we're not using an if else. But conditions are new, so let's talk about what they look like. So a condition in Java is something that evaluates to either true or false. Our first option would be a variable of that type we really haven't done anything with yet, a Boolean variable. Its value is either true or false, so we can just use it in an if statement. For example, suppose I have a Boolean variable is married when getting data from a user. I might say if is married, ask for the spouse's name, so system.out.print, enter spouse's name, and then spouse name is assigned keyboard.getNextLine. Else, we just say the spouse name is not applicable. We don't want to ask the user for the name when we know they're not married. Another kind of condition we might have is a comparison between two numbers. For this purpose, we have six relational operators. And notice it doesn't have to be numbers, it could also be things like characters. Though with objects, we'll talk later about how we can actually compare those. Those don't work with these operators. Numbers and characters do. 
So we have equals. Note that equals is written with two equal signs, not just one. One equal sign is our assignment to operator. Two equal signs for our equals operator. Then we have not equals. This one's going to look a little funny. Got to get used to it. That's what not equals looks like. Less than is familiar. Greater than is familiar. And then we have less than or equal to, which we do have to write in two symbols, the less than and then the equal sign. And same thing for greater than or equal to. Be careful when you're writing Java code by hand to not use the single symbol less than or equal to, greater than or equal to, because those are not available to you in Java. So here's one example of using equals. If pieces of candy mod num people equals zero, so my number of pieces of candy is evenly divisible by the number of people I have, system.out.println, everyone gets the same amount. Else, system.out.println, there will be leftovers because I'm going to have some kind of a remainder. My remainder was not zero. If num1 is less than or equal to num2, smaller value is assigned num1. Else, smaller value is assigned num2. When we're comparing values that are floating point numbers, doubles or floats, we need to be careful. Remember that we can't count on the accuracy of our floating point values, so we never want to use equals with them. Instead, we will get the difference between the two numbers and check to see if it's small enough for us to consider the two numbers equal. Note that this is a great place to use the absolute value function from the math class. The actual number we use for our comparison will depend on the range of the values we're working with. So I've just done something fairly generic here if math.abs, absolute value, num1 minus num2, so the absolute value means I don't have to know which one of those is bigger, is less than 0 0.00001. So that's a small enough number that for many things that will work. If you're working with very small numbers, then you're going to need a much smaller number to do this comparison. There's one more thing I want to talk about regarding our conditions, which are the logical operators we use to combine and negate conditions. First, we have the not operator, which is written with an exclamation point. You will also sometimes hear this called a bang. The fact that this means not should explain to you why not equals is written the way it is. The not operator has very high precedence, so if you're applying it to any complex condition, you will need parentheses around the condition to make sure that the not is applying to the result of the whole thing. Our next logical operator is AND, which is written with two ampersands. Make sure you include both ampersands. A single ampersand is a valid operator, but it doesn't do a logical AND. If both sides of the AND are true, the result will be true. Otherwise, it will be false. So as long as I have anything involved in the AND that is false, the result will be false. Our final logical operator is OR, which is written with two vertical bars. If you're trying to find that on your keyboard, it will be shift backslash. Again, we need both of the vertical bars. OR will be true unless both sides are false. So if one of the two things is true, or both are true, OR is true. So I've got an example here for each of those. If not done, done here must be a Boolean variable. If done is true, not done will be false. If done is false, not done will be true. If letter is greater than or equal to lowercase a, and letter is less than or equal to lowercase z. So this is basically checking is the letter in the range of the lowercase letters. Note we would get tempted to write this the way we would write it in English, which might be A is less than or equal to letter is less than or equal to Z. We cannot do that in Java. In Java, you have to have the two separate conditions and the AND to express this concept. The last one here, if letter equals A, or letter equals E, or letter equals I, or letter equals O, or letter equals U. Basically, 
if letter is a lowercase vowel. Note that we can string these together, though when we start combining conditions, we need to remember that precedence is a thing. So or has the lowest precedence of these three, and is next, and then not has the highest precedence. So we will always do the not first, and then the ands, and then the ors. A last note I want to make is that we don't always need an else when we have an if. For example, if I'm calculating pay and there's overtime, I do the same thing for the regular pay either way. Then if I do have overtime, I have to do something special. There's nothing to go in the else clause. In that case, we just leave it out. Now, be careful to make sure that we leave out the else clause. So if you get tempted to have an empty if clause, change your condition, use not if you have to, to set it up so that you just have an if clause, because an empty else clause we can get rid of. An empty if just confuses everybody. So if we take a look at our flowchart for the no else case, we're going to see that it's the same except that the false branch is just going to go straight on after our if and continue on with the rest. I think that's a lot to absorb in one video, so we'll stop here. Thanks for watching. In the next video, we'll talk about handling decisions where we have more than two options.